Man, got around OG Self back here. And today I have some tales of victory and glory. Where I'll give you some stories to help you to understand how to apply beast mode law to your life as an individual. So it's not just a theoretical concept. So you'll be able to dig down deep and find the inner animal. So if you are aggressed upon or find yourself in a life or death situation, you'll be ready to stand and fight and even die to give your very last breath to ensure that people will know you are not to be messed with. Hey guys, I want to get straight into the topic of today's video. The topic of today's video is going to prison is like getting stuck in quicksand. It's easy to get into, but it's very hard to get out. I want to talk to you guys, man, and really paint a picture of the most dangerous part of going to prison. And I want you to understand that going to prison, dude, is almost like going into a maze. Like, it may seem fascinating on your way in, you know, because it's all this different things going on, things that are new and and different from what you've experienced and maybe even strange and exciting in a morbid kind of a way. But once you get into prison, dude, there's a whole lot of deadly things going on, man. And I think the main thing that people don't understand is if you know a guy that's been to prison, dude, first of all, you got to ask yourself, was he at like a, a level one, level two, like daycare, boy scout, you know, boy scout camp? you know, Kumbaya and Hacky Sack? Or was he at a maximum security prison? And so if he was at a Hacky Sack, whatever, just discount him. That's not even prison, dude. That's like some detention center. But he was at, if he was at a maximum security prison, dude, with some serious killers and murderers and rapists and perverts and cannibals, bro, then you got to ask yourself one of three questions. Was he, A, like a gang member? Because gang members, dude, they're kind of like, to me, a protected class, dude. They got like a bubble. It's like Bubble Boy. They got this bubble of homies surrounding them. So they get to deflect a lot of arrows, bro, depending on your hierarchy within the gang. Number two, you got to ask yourself, dude, is he a career criminal, meaning that he is part of some organizational power structure? It doesn't necessarily have to be a gang. He could be a gangster part of organized crime, like the RICO Act, like the Mafia, like that type of thing. Organized, where you got groups of men that aren't a gang. To me, gangs are just um, like a bunch of wild hyenas running around, you know, even though they're, I don't really believe they're structural organization, SSP. Maybe I don't know enough about gangs. I haven't really studied them, because I really don't care about Shiza. But one thing I did understand is gangsterism, because I'm a businessman. And one thing I liked about being a gangster, growing up in the hood, being a gangster when I was a drug dealer gangster, it's all about me getting money or profit for whatever it is I'm doing. I want to get the most profit possible, and I'm willing to do whatever it takes for those who oppose me. So that's a gangster to me, but I'm not glorifying it. I'm just sharing with you the difference, bro. The only people I associate with are people that are like-minded trying to get this money and we will do whatever we need to do to defend this money or to take it however we see fit. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just sharing with you the differences in how you gangsters versus gangs or organized crime. And then number three, you got to ask yourself the guy this question. Does he have a generational propensity toward incarceration? What does that mean? It's just big words meaning... Is he part of a generation of criminals? So was his dad a criminal or his uncles or his brothers or his cousins? Because he's in a protected bubble bat, bubble boy class as well. Prison is dangerous for the 20% of you guys who are like me, whether you're accountants or dentists or doctors or you're just regular working Joe when you happen to just end up on the wrong side of the law. It's unfortunate, man, because they throw you in there with these hardened criminals, dude. Now you wonder why recidivism is so high and why there's so, there's so much savagery in our society because, dude, they don't differentiate, you know, soft, nonviolent offenders from violent offenders. They just throw you all in there together. 
And God bless you. Good luck to you. So anyway, um, I wanted to share this with you because if you're a part of the 20%, I was just a dude who ended up becoming a drug addict. I never figured I was going to be a drug addict, but I became one and ended up in a bad situation because uh, I needed drugs. And I didn't have any money to purchase drugs because I took my gate money. It's called when you get out of the military. Let's say they gave me $1,000. Let's say for the sake of this argument, let's say they gave me 2000 because they give you enough money for a plane ticket or if you're going to drive and then for hotels along the way. So let's just say they gave me 2000 You know how long $2,000 last year on the crack cocaine habit, dude? And back then, I remember um, I remember an ounce was going for like $1,000, bro. Unless you were getting them. Like when I became a drug dealer, I was getting ounces for 500 But when I was a drug user, they were selling them to me for like 1000 bro. Just goes to show you the difference, right? Consumerism, bro, being a producer versus a consumer. So anyway, let's just go with the thousand dollars. So then, if it's two, if I had two thousand, I very quickly ran through that, bro. And um, and for those of you who are new to my channel, what happened was, it was me and another army buddy. We got kicked out. It was actually. It was actually uh, two of us got kicked out together. And so we, we, we spent our last um, $20 and we got this rock, dude. And then we were like, hey, what are we going to do, man? I was like, man, man, I don't know. But my logical brain came up because I was two different people back then. You know, it's like I had an um, angel on this side and the devil on that side, right? So the devil was like, man, just smoke it, man. You know, don't worry, be happy. And the angel was like, nah, man. Well, I'm just, I don't want to talk badly about angels, but let's just say my my rational thinking dude versus the emotional dude. The rational thinking dude was like, nah, man. Because the area of California, I was in Central California, the later it got, the smaller the rocks got. Like, if you bought a rock during the day, they were huge boulders. But if you got one at, like, 3 in the morning, it was like a little pebble. So I said to my homeboy, man, nah, man, let's just go ahead and, uh, take this rock man and we're going to cut it up into four pieces and we're going to wait till all the zombies have come out and then we're going to sell it to them so we took a twenty dollar rock and we sold it we sold it we cut it into four so we made 24 we made 80 bucks dude so then we just we got smart we was like oh that's cool so then what we did was we were just waited till the next day and then instead of bidding one rock for uh twenty dollars for eighty dollars i think we got like an eight ball i think it was called so anyway it was equivalent to getting like it was equivalent to like getting uh eight rocks bro because when you go to the drug dealers the more you buy at once the better deal you get so then we got the eight rocks and so we did the same thing so you know we had to reward ourselves of course so we split half of them and we smoked the four rocks. We got some women and we tossed them up like strawberries. We was living out. Yeah, dog. We got the magic formula. And so then when we made the 80 off of the 40, off of the 40, I think we made 160. And then Eureka, we found the magic formula. So the reason I'm telling you guys this story, man, is because we very quickly rose to the height from being a drug user to a drug from a consumer to a producer. And we use that same entrepreneurial mindset of self-discipline, you know, business before pleasure, work before play. We very quickly, uh, dude, in a matter of 30 days, dude, we were selling kilos, bro. That's why we were famous, dude. And then we hired other ex-military dudes that got out on bad discharges or disciplinary. We hired them into our army. We hired the youngsters to the, the no gang members are selling drugs, you know, selling low rocks on the corner. We start giving them ounces, dude. And, you know, we started out like eight balls, quarter ounces, ounces, dude. And we rose them up. So when I'm, I'm, the reason I'm building you this backstory, man, it got to the point where, you know, originally we were robbing drug dealers and then we became drug dealers, but then there was like wars going on. So we ended up, and uh, maximum security prison. 
And the whole thing I wanted to share with you, dude, when you go into prison, and if you're not part of a hierarchical organization, it's very easy to get into prison, dude. Like, you know, there's very various reasons you can go to prison. But once you're in there, dude, you have to become very astute at emotional intelligence, dude. And uh, I just want to share this book with you really quick, dude. It's a book called Working with Emotional Intelligence. I don't get any endorsements for it. I'm not trying to encourage you to read it, but I'm telling you in prison, you have to really quickly become in tune with emotional intelligence because most people in prison, dude, they were raised by single moms, dude, and so they, they have the reaction of a female. You know how females get when they're on their period, dude. They, they're very emotional. They cry, they scream, they anger, they throw stuff. They're just like, women are like little kids, bro, and they're like little kids in a full-grown body, bro. And men who are raised by that, you don't learn to emote properly or to be stoic or to think rationally. You react. And that's why there's a lot of murderers in prison. You know, dude, get mad, he'll just smoke you, dude. That's why young dudes are so dangerous now. They're emotional like women. You disrespect the young dude, he'll smoke you. There is no levels of escalation like, hey, my man, I don't appreciate you, you know, when you look at me that way or you talk to me that way. Oh, what you going to do about a sucker? Well, first of all, my name's not sucker, man. All I'm saying is, dude, like, when you interface with me, my man, you don't know me. When you interface with me, dude, if you're not going to come in a respectful manner, we just don't deal with each other. Well, frick you, sucker. We don't have to deal with each other, sucker. Okay, we leave it at that. No harm, no foul. Nobody struck you. Even the dude talked about your mama. There's no need to pull out a strap and smoke a dude, right? Because, you, oh, you talked about my mama. Whatever. So once you're in prison, dude, and you're not part of the protected class, the bubble boy, let's call them the bubble boy people. Dude, you have to very quickly become a student of human behavior and emotional intelligence, dude, because there's so many pitfalls and traps. Dude, you got to look at it like being in the maze. So you know how you go in the maze and you turn one corner, there's a dead end, or you turn another corner, and when you step on the trip mechanism, the bottom drops out, you fall on some spikes, or you go around another corner, there's a minotaur waiting for you. Or you go around another corner, you step on the booby trap, and then these stakes come and stab you, bro. Or you go in another corner, there's some hot lava that falls on you. Or you go in another corner of the maze, you fall in some quicksand. And for those of you who have never been in the jungle, quicksand is an interesting phenomenon. I want to I explain it to you guys that are, that are from like California or Florida or a tropical area or you've been to the beach, and I think you understand. So if you ever, like, have a proclivity, dude, you're just out on the beach and you want to, you know, enjoy the sunshine and some very awesome young women, you know, with nice bodies, and you're walking along the beach, you know, getting a tan, you done some push-ups, you got your swole on. And you ever notice when you're walking on the beach, dude, like, the closer you are to land, the beach is hot and dry, man. It burns your feet. But then the closer you get to what I call the surf, where the water comes in and it resides, you know, it's, I don't know, the ebb and flow of the ocean, right? The ocean waves, wherever the waves come in, the, the sand gets to be cooler and it gets to be moist. And I don't know if you noticed, the, the closer you walk to the ocean, the softer the sand becomes. And here's the thing I want to share with you. I used to play this game with, like, women I would be hanging out with, so to speak. I don't believe in dating, but I would hang out with them. And... We're walking along the beach, dude, and the game was don't let the water hit your feet. So then when the tide comes in, you run up the beach really quick. Ha ha, so funny. Hey, then you run back down. But sometimes the tide comes in so fast, bro, it hits not only does it hit your feet, it goes over your feet and comes up to your waist. But here's the part I want to share with you, to give you a visual to, to help you be in the moment with me. As the water comes back out, it's called an undertow. And as the water comes out, dude, you can feel it taking the sand with it, and then your feet sink down. And you can even sink down into your ankles into the, the, the sand on the beach. So quicksand is like that, except there's no ebb and flow, but it's like an area where murky water is still, and it doesn't ebb and flow in tide, but it's, for some reason it's still in this trap, and then the sand mixes with the water. So it's a thick pace. And so then you're walking, and it's like your little pits. But it's a big pit where, I mean, it can go pretty deep. All it's got to be is like eight feet deep, bro. You're done. Or even seven feet. 
So you're walking, 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 then you hit the boop, and then you start sinking, dude. And instead of most people trying to go back, they start welling around. Next thing you know, you're in a slippery slope. You're in the quicksand, and it just starts coming. That's why they call it quicksand. It starts going up. And you can't even move in it, dude. And then all of a sudden, you're stuck in there. And without somebody sticking like a branch, a really sturdy branch, and then pulling you out, like a couple of dudes to pull you out. Not one dude like you see in the movies. It's a couple of dudes, bro. Unless the dudes are savage like me. Hey, dude, you're done. So prison is like quicksand in the fact that when you go in there and you're new and you're not part of like some organization or some hierarchical generational dude thing or part of some power struggle or you're not a big powerful dude or a protective bubble boy gang member. Bro, you can get entrapped into all the different politics and the diplomacy dude and the drama. Prison's got a lot of drama and see what happens is, as I've said in a lot of my videos, dude, you can end up killing somebody, dude. Because if you don't have emotional intelligence, like when I went in there, I was a, uh, uh, how do I say this to you, dude? I was a, uh, I was an emotional, um, yeah. I was an emotional powder keg, dude. Because, dude, I was smoking an ounce of crack a day. Every day, bro. I smoked, so check this out, dude. I would sell real estate during the day. And crack at night. And here's the transition that I did, bro. It was a funny thing, man. It was not funny, but it's just the way it is. So as you know, you sell real estate, man. Most times you sell real estate till about, you know, six, seven, eight, because people get off work about five or six. They want to come to an open house. You walk them through, and then as it starts to get dark, normal people got to go home to their families. It's like the movie A Mega Man, dude. You know. When 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 the when the darkness comes, darkness falls. People know the streets get weird. It's just I, I especially notice that in Los Angeles and San Francisco, dude. Like you can be in some of the nicest areas of downtown, but then as soon as the darkness hits, the zombies start coming out, man. And you can park your car in a nice place you think is nice during the day, but at night the zombies are surrounding your car. So most um, law-abiding citizens, bro. And you notice this theme in movies as well. When it starts to get dark, people are like, man, we got we to gotta get to the house, man. So anyway, man, as it got darker, I knew I had to deal with the savages, man. So what I would do, man, is uh, me and my homies, man, we would get in formation and we would go running on the beach. Because in California, you can run on the beach until... Uh, you know, until... Uh, I think it's until about 10 o'clock at night, man. So we go run on the beach and we go and uh, we'd be practicing martial arts on the beach because I had a battle ready because we never knew we'd have to kick a dude's house in and take people hostages, man. Where's the dope, man? Or where's our money? And then we would go to the gym. And here's the funny part. I'm not going to say any names. But it was a a big family in where an area where I lived that was two big families that controlled the drugs until I rose up. And they were bodybuilders, dude, bodybuilders and powerlifters. So the way that we did it is we would meet at the gym, dude, and you would park you would park your car next to theirs, and you would have a gym bag, and you would, you know, and you have the gym bag with money, and they'd have a gym bag with product. So then you get done working out, and be like, hey man, let me let me see that protein that you're taking because you're getting pretty strong. Yeah, come meet me at the car, and then they pop the trunks open. There's protein and supplements and vitamins, but then there's the product in the gym bag, and it is. Your money, your gym bag. Now, yeah, let me sell something. Oh, here's from that for you. Yeah, there's yours. And you know that the, the right amount of cocaine, whatever many ounces you were buying was in there, they knew the right amount of money because if something was going to ride, you're going to handle your business. But we had a good relationship. So that's why it was convenient to go to the gym. I want to tie it together. That's why it's convenient for me to be a bodybuilder and work out. And then those families never knew that I was a smoker. Because I was lumped up. Nobody would believe that. Nobody believed I was a smoker, bro, ever. And a lot of the um, a lot of the people when I was a patient, they didn't know I was huge because I would wear my military jacket. So it was really baggy. Couldn't tell. I just looked like I had on baggy clothes, but I was swole. So anyway, the reason I bring that up, smoking an ounce a day, bro, after you've been working out, bro, like after you run and then do martial arts and then you... You know, you lift weights. You got some of euphoria going, and then your um, respiration is deeper. So when I would hit the crack pipe, man, the cloud smoke come up, and I would beam up. 
Starship Enterprise, dude, and I'm just feeling it all through my body, tingling, dude, and I'm just like on another dimension, man. And I last for about 30 minutes, bro, and I come down like, whoo, that was a bell ringer, man. Where I been? You were sitting in a circle of dudes and women. Like, this is how we did it. We were ballers. So it would be me and a girl, then my homie and a girl, and then my other homie and a girl, my other homie and a girl. And then there would be some extra girls there because sometimes we want two, three women. We just ballers, right? So we, it's called Puff Puff Pass. Are you... You beam up, man. Oh, and it's such a euphoric thing. That's why people be hooked on crack, bro. And then when you come down, man, you, you pass the pipe, dude. And then you just sit there numb. And so it takes about 30 minutes for the pipe to go around because there used to be a bunch of us smoking. We had crack houses where, and this is how, I don't want to say I was an entrepreneur. I think this is how foolish I was. We would sell crack in the front of the house where it's weighed and distributed and cooked and all that. And then we would sell crack in the front of the house and then you could go smoke in the back of the house. And the problem with that is when some dudes would run out of crack, then they become like a leech and they ask the people, you know, can you hit? But then the, if you were smart, what you would do when you had crack, whether you had an eight ball or even two um, rocks, you would share with other people. So therefore nobody noticed when you ran out, right? And so we had some pretty, you know, cool, well-to-do people that smoke crack. So it kind of worked out. But the reason I'm, the reason I'm bringing that up, dude, I smoked an ounce every day, dude, every day. So then I had this crack crystallized in my bloodstream. Because one time I had a heart attack. I hit some crack, dude. And this is how I got the heart attack. I want to be honest with you. So I used to have this torch because I was a baller and I hit the crack. So you melt it on the uh, pipe and then I hit it. The big-ass torch. <laughs> And so then this hot lady, man, this hot crack addict who ended up selling her JJ for me to get money. Because I was the type of dude, just because you're hot, you ain't just going to be smoking crack. Like, you got to be bringing me some money. I was always a businessman. So she's like, baby, you wasting the crack with that big torch. You should use a match. And so she just taught me how to use a match. So what happens, we use a torch, bro, and, and the crack liquefies it, aromatizes too, so you don't get all of it in. But when you use a match... It liquefies. You get straight liquid crack. And I hit, I put a big boulder on there and I hit it and I beamed up like, no, but then my ears didn't stop ringing, bro. My eyes didn't roll back down and my heart started going, boom, 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 boom. And I got stalled darkness, bro. And I started getting tingly all over, like not the same normal tingly. And I was like, oh, something ain't right. And I couldn't catch my breath, dude. And I started getting real tingly and stripping sweat all over, bro. And my ears kept ringing. Because when you smoke crack, your ears ring, and they come back down. It's called a bell ringer. But they kept ringing. So I was like, I told my homie, it's like, hey, no, something right, man. And they was like, oh, man, you had a bell ringer. <laughs> but I, my heart was beating so hard, I couldn't catch my breath. And I felt like pain shooting on my body. That's not crack. So I took out my 9 million and I caught it. <laughs> Hey, man, I'm getting ready to check out. So all you motherfuckers is checking out with me. And then my homeboy goes, hold up, Bo G. Hold up, man. It's all good, baby. What you want me to do? Hey, man, take me to the emergency room. So then dude took me to the emergency room, bro. And he dropped me off because you can't just. We was drug dealers with warrants out for us. So he dropped me off. And the doctor told me, hey, it's lucky thing you got here because your, your blood was like. 99.9% .9 crystallized cocaine. So they gave me this uh, saline solution to, you know, dilute my the, the cocaine concentration. Of course, they called the cops. But once my heart rate settled down, I was like, hell, that shit, bro. I came to my senses, bro, because the saline solution kind of washed everything out. And I left out of there. And I didn't smoke crack for about a week, bro. Yeah, because I was, you know. But anyway... I eventually started smoking crack in, but the reason I'm bringing it up, when I got to prison, bro, just all the crystallized crack, I never used the match again, but all the crystallized crack in my bloodstream, I would be high, dude, for weeks. And then sometimes, you know, like, you know how, uh, you know how your blood recirculates, bro? Sometimes there's like these crystallized patches that would hit me. They would dislodge from somewhere and hit my brain. And I, I get a crack high in prison, even though I wasn't smoking crack. So what I'm trying to say is, dude, 
when I first went to prison, I was an emotional powder keg, bro. Because I was having crack withdrawals, bro. I was so upset because there was a snitch in my camp. You know, I, I, I sold a house to, uh, I bought a house and I had a, a single mom crack. Um, well, what's the word for, I can use it, don't demonetize me. I had a woman who gave her body for in return to get some crack, but she was a single mom. And her brother was a wannabe drug dealer, dude, you know, but he's more of a smoker. So I let them run the house. And then when the house got busted, he, he laid, they both laid, laid down on me and turned over state's evidence, bro. And told him my real name because, of course, the real estate papers got to be in my real name. So anyway, that's what led to my other five houses being hit because they knew about my whole organization. I was so stupid back then. I thought I was above law. But anyway, I was so angry about that because I took this lady off the street and her scummy brother and gave him what I thought was a better life. I know I was doing dirt, but now, now I realize it. But back now, I was so angry. So I was an emotional powder case. So anytime a dude challenged me, dude, or said anything, bro, it was just so ferocious and just so much pain from not being on crack anymore, bro. And withdrawals, bro. I just would go off, bro. And I quickly start getting more time. I get put in the shoe, more shoe, more shoe. Dudes want to retaliate, dude. Dude, it's like the Jesse James syndrome. The more dudes I broke off, the more dudes. Because in prison, everybody want to be the alpha. They want to be the one. So then, man, what happened when I get the new Folsom, bro, or San Quentin, I'm breaking dudes off, bro. Then there's what was cool about San Well, I'm not going to say it's cool because I'm not glorifying it. What was interesting about San Quentin, dude, there were so many race rides, bro, between the blacks and the Mexicans or the blacks and the whites or the Serenos and the Norteños and, the, you know, just all kind of crips and bloods. There was always some rides. So you get, to, you get to get out and fight and not get in trouble because everything is just, you know, chaotic, bro. So I got to release a lot of adrenaline madness and I never got in trouble, right? But then when I got the new Folsom and I was breaking dudes off and they started giving me more time because I already had 26 years and they started giving me, because in, in prison you get a thing called good time. I found this out when I got the Folsom that if you program, you get half time. So that mean out of 26 years, I would have did uh, 26 divided by two. Let's just say I would have did 13 years. I'm just off the top of my head, man. I'm not a math major. But I didn't know that until I got there. I had already broke a couple of dudes off and I was in the shoe, in the shoe for 90 days, bro. And then your time stops so you don't get good time. But then, you know, fortunately for me, my lawyer, I had a good lawyer. He filed an appeal. And then um, about a year later, they told me I'm going back to court on appeal to get my sentence reduced. So then I had to very quickly understand that being emotionally explosive I was digging myself deeper and deeper into the quicksand. I was never going to get out. And the reason I bring that up, there was a couple of guys that I knew that didn't control their emotions and they killed some people and they never got out, bro. They ended up doing life. Fortunately for me, you know, I'm just being honest, me going in, being a savage, just breaking dudes off and knowing martial arts, knowing where to kick a dude's knee out, dude, or break his clavicle, bro, or break his jaw, dude, or this judo flip him on his face and bust his face up. These people never died, but they were so fricked up that people that saw it would be like, oh, man, snap, I don't want that to happen to me. You know what I'm saying? So then when the, when the shot caller would be like, hey, man, we're going to retaliate against that mixed dude, that mixed mutt dude, and you're going to go... You're going to go and get him, homie. And the homie be like, man, I'm just going to PC up because I don't want my whole cranium cracked open like that, right? So anyway, fortunately for me, I had went in there early doing that. So then by the time I realized that I was going down a black hole and I was never going to get out, and there's other people that came into prison with shorter time than me and ended up getting life. I realized I handled myself differently, so I started using mind games and chess and strategies, dude. And so I'm sharing that with you because, dude, I've seen a lot of cats come into prison, bro, and then they end up with life sentences, bro. Or they end up with more time than they originally had. So I don't know what happened to them because when you're in prison, like say you're in prison A and you get into a squirmage, like a serious squirmage, and you, you attempted murder or you 
great bodily harm, but you didn't murder a person, but you know, you're going to get more time and they put you on a different yard. So then some Kaisers or some Kaiser just letters or notes saying, Hey man, get dude. And then you get into another squirmish. Like one time I was in one prison, I was in, I was in, uh, I was in New Folsom and I went to, there, there was A, B and C yard I ended up on A and B yard. And then when I got to Mule Creek, there was A, B and C yard. And then, at, no, at Mule Creek, there was, uh, maybe there was an ABC yard too, I don't remember. But I ended up on all three yards, bro. And then at Avenal, there was five yards. And it's not level five, but it's level two. But they have five different, like one yard, two. I ended up on all, ended up on three of the five yards, bro. And so what I'm trying to say, if you're in a prison and then you, you get in so much trouble, you, you've hit all three yards because the inmates send kites. Get that fool. Then they send you to another prison, bro. So I don't know what happened when these dudes got more time. I don't know what happened when they got to another prison. Luckily for me, when I got to other prisons, dude, there'd be other guys on the bus with you that know, man, this dude's a savage. And then any celly I had, man, I just want to be honest with you here, and I don't want to get demonetized on YouTube, but every time I had, every celly I had, and they'd be like, hey, my man, you know, like, uh, you know, I miss my wife. Or, man, when I was on the street, I was a baller. Or I was running things. Or, you know what I'm saying? I shot some dudes. I'd be like, hey, man, check this out, homie. I really don't give a shiza, dude. And matter of fact, dude, I don't want to care what your name is, who you are, what you set you from. I don't give a flipping, flipping, beep, bop, beep, bop, boop. You understand? So long as we in the cell together, we ain't got nothing to say, dude. You stay over there on your side of the bunk and let me do my martial arts, homie, and it's all good. Or else we can handle it right now because today's a good day to die, dog. And what happened in most situations would be one of three things. Either A, the next day dude would get a cell change. B, he would just leave me the frick alone. Or C, I'd have to break dude off. And I only had to do that a few times. But the moral of the story is this, guys. When you get in a prison, dude, it's like quicksand. It's very easy to get into the system or get on paperwork, as they call it, or get a number. But, dude... Everybody that goes to prison, they don't make it out. That's the whole thing. And the people that do, you got to ask those three questions, dude. Is you have generational incarceration? Are you part of some organizational structure like you're a big time crime syndicate? Or are you a gang member? If, if you don't fall into those, it's very easy if you're a drug addict or a drunk or alcoholic or just some kind of shoplifter. And if you, I mean, when you go to maximum security prison, it's very easy to get in there. And if you don't understand prison politics and diplomacy, dude, and being in control of your emotions, knowing when to strike, dude, and why to strike, or maybe like the art of war. Sometimes the best, the best, the best war, the best um, plan is not to fight at all. But you have to learn that through being a student behavior. So this video has gone long enough. I just want to, you know do my part to my good deed today and tell the youngsters, man, stay out of prison, dude. It's not, it's not what you think it is. You don't need to go there to get stripes or whatever. I think the best stripes you can do is be like, um, this dude, Marquette, the Von Burton dude, and just become really successful in corporate America, bro. And then to maybe be a big brother in some of these programs where you can talk to impoverished youths who want to hear, there's a different way. You can show them there's light at the end of the tunnel. There's light outside of the darkness. And then you can get your street creds that way. Because, dude, all that bad boy image, gangster, drug dealer, all that stuff, bro. The women that you attract, these hood rat, hood rat, hoochie mamas, man, or these home girls, you know what I'm saying, that's down for the vario, bro. Why do you want to have a, a baby with this type of woman who's just going to... Um, I don't know the word, but to to continue this legacy of hoodism or ghettoism or varioism or trailer trashism. Come on, dude. The seed that produces from your body, your genetic pool, the secret to life is you want them, you want to elevate them higher than you. And there's a book called Standing on the Shoulders of Giants, meaning that whatever you've accomplished in your life, do your progeny or your offspring, you want them to stand on your shoulders to see even further than you. And that will be your legacy that your seed it's going to the promised land and they're seeing things that you can never imagine, dude. So until next time, hold yourself.